The Downfall of Lancelot Biggs by Nelson S. Bond Originally published in Weird Tales, March 1941 Narrated by Tom Trisse We were about three hours out of Long Island Spaceport, and I had just finished swapping farewell insults with Joe Marlowe, head bug pounder at Luna 3, when the door of my radio turret slid open, and in slithered, if round things can slither, Cap Hansen, skipper of a gallant space-going scow, the Saturn. The old man's eyes were as wide as a lady bowler's beam, and his face, which boasts a pale mauve hue even under normal circumstances, was now a ripe, explosive fuchsia. He jammed a pudgy forefinger against his lips. Shh! He shhed. He squeezed in and closed the door behind him, shot a nervous glance about the room, then wheezed throatily. Is there anybody here, Sparks? Nobody, I told him, but us and Paz. Why all the desperate Desmond stuff, Skipper? Got an old corpus delicti you want hid? You might try the airlock. He snapped back to normal with a profane bang. Don't be a damned fool, Donovan. I ain't murdered any members of my crew yet. Though if I ever do, I've got a good notion who to start with. I've got reason to be cautious. I only learned something. Listen. He hunched forward and shoved his lips so close to my ear that I could almost hear his whiskers sprouting. You know that Captain Cooper, which come aboard at Long Island? The quarantine officer, you mean? Quarantine officer, your eye. The skipper's voice was triumphant. He ain't no more a QO than I'm the Queen of Sheba. He's an inspector from the SSCB. An inspector, I gasped. From the Space Safety Control Board. Why, why, that means... Exactly, Hansen rubbed his hands gleefully. It means that Lance is being examined for a commander's brevet. Well, what do you think of that? My son-in-law, captain of his own ship, and him with only one year's active service. I said, that's swell, and meant it. The old man exaggerated a trifle when he called Lancelot Biggs his son-in-law. Biggs's marriage to Diane Hansen was not scheduled to take place yet for a couple of months, but with Hansen I could enthuse over the prospect of seeing Biggs win his four stripes and his own command. Lieutenant Lancelot Biggs was not only my superior officer, he was my friend as well. He had once been my bunkmate. I had watched him rise from a gangling, awkward, derided third mate to first officer, had been present when he earned his master navigator's papers, had seen him overcome seemingly insurmountable handicaps of appearance and personality to win a place in the affections of crew and command alike. A screwball gent, this Biggs, tall, angular, inconceivably skinny, graced or disfigured with a phenomenally active Adam's apple that bobbed eternally up and down in his skinny throat like an unswallowed cud, but blessed with two saving graces, a swell sense of humour, and a brain. True, his thought processes were oft times fantastically involved. His motto, get the theory first, sometimes led him down dark passageways of logic. But there never was a problem too deep for him. Time and again his screwy logic had saved the personnel of the Saturn from peril to person or purse. So, that's well, I said, and meant it. Then I stared at the skipper thoughtfully. But why? I asked him. Tell me about it. Biggs is the man to tell. Hansen's eyes clouded, and he gnawed savagely at a grubby fingernail. That's just it, Sparks. I can't tell him. Why? I demanded. Laryngitis? Or ain't you and him speaking? I can't tell him, explained the skipper. "'because it would be unethical. "'You see, when a man's been examined for his commander's stripes, "'he ain't supposed to know about it. "'That's why Cooper came aboard under an alias. "'He wants to watch Lance perform his routine duties in routine fashion, "'like nothing unusual was going on. "'Then, at the end of the trip, 
He'll tell Lance who he is, give him a verbal exam on the space safety code, navigation practices, etc., and so on, and there you are. There, I agreed. I am. So where am I? Still in the dark, Skipper. Why tell me? Hansen glared at me witheringly. If you was as deaf, he said, making noises like a sizzling steak, as you are dumb, the corporation might give me a new radio operator for his here jallop, I mean, ship. Look, stupid, Biggs has ought to know he's been watched by an examiner, shouldn't he? Not that he don't know how to do things right, but because, well, because every so often the boy gets wacky ideas and starts trying experiments. And we don't want him trying nothing like that, do we? Not on this shuttle. So, being as how you're his chum, and since it would be unethical for me to spill the beans, you've got to tell him. Warn him to lay off the nonsense. Get it? I got it. I nodded. OK, Skipper, you're right and I'm wrong, as you usually are. I'll warn him. Only, I hesitated, and the old man halted with one hand on the doorknob, looked back at me impatiently. Only what? Only, if it's supposed to be a deep, dark secret, wouldn't it be unethical for me to tell him too? Don't, snorted Hansen, be a donkey, Sparks. Whoever heard of a radio man with a sense of honour? Get word to him, and make it snappy too. He comes on in half an hour, and I don't want he should pull any boners in front of Cooper. Goodbye now. The door slammed behind him. So pretty soon there was a commotion in the rampway, like a trained seal stumbling around on hobnailed stilts. A rap sounded on my door, and I said, Come on in, Mr. Biggs, and sure enough, it was him. He ambled in, grinned lazily, and said, Hi, what's new? Nothing, I said, under the sun. And you heard the adage, Look, Mr. Biggs, you go on duty pretty soon, is that right? That's right. Well, you don't happen, I asked him shrewdly, to have any bright new inventions hatching under your skull, do you? Like the uranium time trap, for instance, or the velocity intensifier? He said, Now, Sparks, can I help it if neither of them worked exactly as I had planned? After all, answer, I insisted, yes or no, do you? He flushed and wriggled one toe in the carpet. Well, not exactly. I did have a little idea I wanted to try out, though, an anti-gravitic attachment. On the cargo lofts, it occurred to me that, well, junk it, I said, hasten, don't hobble to the nearest incinerator and give your diagrams the good old Hebrew. He said, eh? and looked faintly startled. Eh, he repeated, his liquescent larynx immelmanned. But why, Sparks? I said, them stripes on your sleeve, Lieutenant, they're pretty, aren't they? He glanced down, fingered his triple braid proudly. Why, why, yes, very pretty, I'm proud of them. But the more there are, I pointed out, the prettier they are, isn't that right? I, I suppose so. But what has that to do with Sparks? His voice raised to a shout, and suddenly his pale eyes brightened. Do you mean that? Nothing else but. That alleged QO mug, Cooper, is a phony. He's really an SSCB inspector, and since he's not riding the Saturn for his health, I'll give you one guess who he's watching, if you start with yourself. Funny what emotion will do to a guy. Biggs was not the type to go into a blue funk. I've seen him face danger, disgrace, and death, not once, but many times. Every time he had confronted the situation calmly, coolly, nary a quake or quiver stirring him. But here, handed good news on a silver platter, I thought for a minute he was going to pass out. His eyes grew stalks, and his knees began to rattle like a marimba. The confused burble emanating from his lips resembled the vocal efforts of a tongue-tied hippo trying to speak Choctaw. His Adam's apple. But why mention that monstrosity? Even I don't believe the things it did, and I saw it. Words finally grew out of the melange of guttural sibilance and expectorance. Biggs's eyes receded into their sockets, became dewy and wistful, 
like the orbs of an immersed smitten adolescent. His voice was hushed and awed. "'My own ship,' he breathed. "'My own command!' "'Don't cross your bridges,' I reminded him, "'until they're hatched. "'You still got to win your letter, chum. Two letters, in fact. "'I, F. "'You become Skipper Biggs, if you pass the exam. "'Now get to work, and remember, "'don't let on you know who this Cooper is. "'Deodorant's the word.' "'I gave him a shove toward the door. "'It disappeared in a haze of little pink clouds, "'and I flopped into his seat, "'feeling so bad I could have bawled like a kid, "'but despising myself for feeling that way. "'It was selfish, I guess. "'Biggs deserved the honour. "'But somehow... "'Well, damn it! "'I sort of hated to see him leave the Saturn. "'We'd had a lot of fun together, our bunch. "'Cap Hansen and Chief Garrity, Dick Todd, the second, "'and Wilson, the third, and Biggs, and me. "'Well... Things settled down into normalcy then. The Saturn is a ten-day freighter, which meant that Cooper would have beaucoup opportunity to judge Biggs's capabilities. So tempers fidgeted, and I fidgeted, and the old man came within two spasms of a nervous breakdown, and Biggs, as might have been expected, got his nerves on ice after that first shock and performed his routine duties in ultra-stellar fashion. My duties were far from exacting, Four times a day I had to contact a space station to check our course, speed and declination against solar constant. That was just regulation blah, though, because with Biggs plotting the course, we had about as much chance of getting off the line as a rural subscriber when a juicy scandal is being discussed. It was also my job to keep in touch with Luna 3, which daily interlude, Joe Marlowe being the low scutter years, was the only disturbing influence in an otherwise languid existence. Understand, I don't believe for a minute that my gal, Maisie Bell, was out with him. She's true to me. But it was a dirty trick for him to say she was, and beside, how the hell did he learn about that birthmark if— Oh, the hell with it. The fact is that time passed, and pretty soon it was the sixth day— and in just a few more days we'd dock at Mars Central, and Lieutenant Biggs would be Captain Biggs. Because if I had been idle on this shuttle, my raw-boned friend had not. Cooper had been putting him through a series of strenuous paces to test his knowledge, ability and resourcefulness. The trajectory computations had mysteriously disappeared, for instance, and Biggs had to compile a new set. When he went to use the calculometer, he discovered it to be accidentally on purpose out of order, so he had to evolve the figures from his own cranium. Then there was the false alarm fire in the storage compartments, while Biggs was on the bridge, and the hypers went on the blink, with Biggs on duty, and one of the aft jets clogged. Guess who was standing watch at the time? That sort of thing. But Biggs came through every time, with flying colours, and with each succeeding success, another of the grim, suspicious lines melted from around the corners of Inspector Cooper's mouth until he was beginning to look almost like a human being. Meanwhile, Cap Hansen's face got daily ruddier, happier, and grinnier. He was just one big smile on legs as he saw his son-in-law to be coming closer and closer to the coveted stripes. "'Just four more days, Sparks,' he chortled happily to me. And then, just three more days, just two more, he rubbed his hairy paws together gleefully. Two captains in the same family. Ain't that something? Boy, did you see the way he come through on that test yesterday. Cooper got Garrity to cross the heat control and grav plates. The ship was hot and weightless at the same time. So that's what it was, I grumbled. Hell, who's taking this test? Bigs or us guinea pigs? I went soaring to the ceiling, boiling like a kettle, and with the graves off I couldn't even drip sweat. But Lance fixed it, gloried Hansen, spotted the trouble in three minutes flat, and had the circuit straight before you could say hypertensile dynamics. What a lad! Two more days, I said. All I hope is that I can live through it, if Cooper gets any more wacky ideas. Harumph! 
came a voice from the doorway. I spun, startled. What did my mamma tell me about talking in front of a person's back? It was Inspector Cooper. I said, Look, Inspector, the acoustics are lousy in this room. Anything you heard which might have sounded like your name was strictly coincidental. He glared at me, then at Cap Hansen, then at me. And boy, what I mean, that guy could really glare. So, he said, Inspector, eh? Uh-oh. It dawned on me, all of a sudden, but too late, that I'd upset the legumes with a vengeance, calling him Inspector, when, so far as I was concerned, he was an officer in the quarantine service. Inspector, eh? he repeated, and crisped Hansen's burning cheeks with a glance. Well, Captain, it is just as I thought. Too many years of service have taken the toll on your discretion. When you start taking common radio men into your confidence— I did the best I could. I rallied around. Now wait a minute, Inspector, I said. Captain Hansen didn't tell me who you were. I, I guessed it. I'm pretty good at things like that. I figured it out the first time I saw you. It's my psychic. It will be your neck, he snarled, if you don't shut your yap. Well, now that you know who I am, I might as well tell you why I'm here. I need your cooperation in giving Lieutenant Biggs his final test. Some of the chagrin left Hansen's eyes. His voice was hopeful. Final test? Yes. I confess to a very great respect for your first mate, Captain Hansen. He has proven himself capable in each of the tests offered so far. His theoretical knowledge is matched by his physical ingenuity. I have awarded him the highest possible grades in astrogation, analytical judgment, and general knowledge. If he passes the final test, resourcefulness, and of course the verbal quiz on safety code practices, I shall take great pleasure in submitting his name for advancement. This test, he turned to me, will be made in your department, Sparks. You, he transfixed me with an icy glare. You are sick. Who, me? Yes, you have, hmm, let me see, dyspepsia. It's a lie, I said indignantly. I haven't been near one of them Venusian joy joints for a year. You have, repeated Cooper coldly, a bad case of dyspepsia, which is another name for indigestion, young man. You will develop this ailment immediately, and since the captain of a space-going vessel is supposed to be able to step into the breach in any emergency, Lieutenant Biggs will be assigned the task of relieving you at your post. Wow! Was that a break for our side? I darned near split a lip, trying to hide the great big grin that leaped to my gabber. If there was any man aboard the Saturn whose knowledge of radio was equal to my own, that man was Lancelot Biggs. Why, he was the inventor of a new type of radio transmission plate. If this were to be his final test, he would breeze home, win, place, and show. But Cooper didn't notice the elation in my eyes, or the equal joy in the skipper's optics. He was finishing his instructions. And because you have learned who I am, Sparks, I suggest that you make no attempt to get in touch with or speak to Lieutenant Biggs. You may consider yourself confined to quarters for the duration of the trip. Very good, sir, I said. And now, Cooper turned to my instruments, we shall set the stage for Mr. Biggs's final test. He picked up a hammer, the biggest one in the turret. He lifted it, weighed it briefly in his paw, and then, wham! Things clanked and clattered, glass tinkled, wires leaped from the innards of my set and wriggled out onto the floor like tiny metal snakes. Cap groaned, and I screamed, Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I screamed. Let go! Stop it! Are you off your jets? Stand back, Sparks, warned Cooper. He raised the hammer again, again brought it down ferociously into the entrails of my beautiful transmission set. Clinkety-clatter! Something shorted. Blue fire spat. There was a loud pop, 
and I had to clutch my breast to make sure it wasn't my heart. Stand back, he panted. We, we've got to make this a tough test. We, I howled. And then he was done. He stepped back and studied his work with a pleased look of a ghoul in a graveyard. I think that should do the trick, he said gravely. If he can repair this set and get it in working order, I'll give him top grade in resourcefulness. Very well now, Captain, you may return to the bridge and tell Biggs that Sparks has been suddenly overcome with illness. And you, Sparks, to your quarters. And don't forget, you're sick. I stared miserably at my once perfect apparatus. I passed a hand over my brow and tottered to the doorway. "'Maybe you think,' I wailed, "'I'm not.' Well, I began to feel well enough to sit up and take notice, along about lunchtime. Doug Enderby, the steward of our void-cavorting madhouse, brought me my grub. He tiptoed in and laid the tray on the desk before me. He whispered, "'Are you feeling better, Bert?' "'Never worse,' I told him gloomily. "'Why are the crepe on the victuals? Are they that bad?' I whipped off the napkin, took one gand at my so-called lunch, and bleated like a branded sheep. "'Great monsoons of Mars! What the hell is this?' "'Shh!' hushed Enderby. "'Poached egg sparks!' "'I can see them,' I hollered. I stared at the pair of baleful golden horrors on toast. "'And they can see me, too! Take him away!' Enderby said petulantly, "'But you're sick. That's what Captain Cooper said.' "'Cooper, eh?' I groaned. "'I always said it wasn't smart to make torture illegal. "'Then I remembered why I was confined to Durance Vile. "'You seen Biggs?' I asked. "'No, he hasn't been down to lunch. "'He had to take over for you when you were taken ill.' "'Doug looked anxious. "'There, there's something wrong in your turret, Sparks. "'The intercommunication system is out, and the radio won't work.' I glanced at my watch. Two hours had passed since Cooper's coup. Hardly time for Lance to unscramble the mess of pottery. "'Well, cheer up,' I said. "'Everything will be O.Q. in a little while.' "'Ugh!' I pushed my toast and tea toward him. "'Look, pal, how's the cow situation in the galley? You got a nice three-inch steak, rare, with onions?' "'Sirloins,' said Doug, "'for dinner.' In that case, I sighed, I'll give this hen fruit a miss. See you at dinner time. Doug nodded sagely and sidled toward the doorway. Steaks, he said, for the crew, but you get milk toast. You're a sick ma Hey! Well, I almost nailed him with that second poached egg, anyway. After he beat it, I opened the door and peeked out, and sure enough, one of the sailors was standing down at the end of the corridor. Cooper was a canny duck. He was going to make certain that I didn't get loose and help Biggs. But Cooper wasn't the only guy with smart ideas. I hadn't been radio operator on the Saturn for three years for nothing. There were a couple of wrinkles in the wiring system that even the installation department knew nothing about. I ducked back into my cabin, locked the door carefully, hung my coat over the keyhole, and pulled back my mattress. Underneath, nestling coyly amongst the box springs of my bunk, was a tiny, complete transmission reception set. I'm no dummy. Midnight watches are a bore, and many is a time I turned in with a pair of earphones on rather than sit nodding in the turret for dreary hours waiting for messages that might never come in. Of course, this auxiliary set was useless so long as the main set was o o o but by listening in i could tell how lance was coming along with his repair job perhaps give him a little assistance by remote control should he need it so i donned the phones and just like i thought the circuit was as cold as a ditch digger's toes in siberia for a few seconds then all of a sudden something squawked and a familiar voice came from far, far away. The voice of Lancelot Biggs saying, That ought to do it. Now, let me see if... 
I hugged myself gleefully. The old master mind had done it again. In just two hours and sixteen minutes. Tell me Lancelot Biggs isn't a genius. I shoved my puss to the mic. I hissed, Lance! There was a brief silence. Then Biggs's curious response. Is that you, Sparks? In person, I told him, and not a facsimile. How are you getting along, pal? Why, all right, I guess, he clucked, and I could envision the rueful shake of his head. It was a frightful mess, Sparks. How you ever let it get in that condition? I let it get in that condition, I told him, like I got sick, by orders of Madman Cooper. That guy's a wingding with a mace, ain't he? Where do you get the replacement parts? Out of the supply locker, mostly. I had to rewind the L-49 armature, though. We had no spares. You'd better throw a shunt across a number four Rio, I suggested. You're heterodyning on vocal freak. Otherwise, you seem to have matters under control. Nice going, bud. I guess you know this is your final test. I suspected it. Well, I'm going to test now. See if I can contact Luna 3. Stand by, Sparks. I'll cut you into the circuit so you can hear. Current hummed and squealed. Dots and dashes ripped the ether as Biggs pulsed a signal to Mother Earth's satellite. Slow seconds dragged. We are very close to Mars, and it takes a message almost two and a half minutes to make the hurdle from the green planet to the red one. I waited tensely, and then, faint and far, but yet clear, came the reply. Answering IPS Saturn. Go ahead, Saturn. It was Joe Marlowe's hand on the bug. I could tell that. You know how it is. Every operator has a transmitting style just as distinctive as handwriting. Go ahead, Saturn. Then, are you sober, Donovan? I gritted my teeth. But Biggs put an end to Joe's smart stuff with his next transmission. Donovan ill. Relief man at key. Saturn reporting for orders. Any orders, Luna? Any orders? Marlowe flashed back. Sorry about Donovan. Nothing trivial, I hope. Yes, have one order, Saturn, from SSCB. Headquarters to Inspector Commander Cooper. If Lieutenant Biggs passes examination, assign him immediately to command of thump, thump, thump. Damn, of all the times to be interrupted, just at the happy, crucial moment when I was about to learn the ship to which Biggs was going to be assigned, and some idiot had to come banging at my door. Thump, thump, thump. Just a minute, I howled. I switched off the unit and shoved the mattress back into place, rumpled the sheets, tussled my hair, and pulled my shirt off. I stumbled to the door, unlocked it, and stood back, yawning and rubbing my eyes as if I had just hopped out of the arms of Morpheus. Come on in, I said. What's a big idea? Uh, oh, uh, how do you do, sir? My visitor was Inspector Cooper. He pushed past me into the room, glared around suspiciously, turned and heaved me an extraordinary evil glare. What were you doing in here, Sparks? Don't lie to me. What were you doing at the exact moment I knocked? Behind him, ashen-faced, stood Cap Hansen. He knew about the auxiliary unit. One more bite, and his forefinger nail would be bitten off to the second joint. The exact moment? I stalled. That's what I said. I held my breath, which is one way to create a most maidenly blush. I said, I, I respectfully decline to answer, sir, my reputation. Your reputation, roared Inspector Cooper, is not worth a damn anyway. Answer, sir. I shrugged. I said, Well, after all, you can't be caught marshalled for dreaming. You see, there was this blonde kitten named Dolly, sweet kid, but, well, reckless, and I was— Cooper turned crimson, and he wasn't a bit happy. What? You claim you were sleeping. We distinctly heard you talking, Donovan. Who were you talking to? I said plaintively, Well, it was this way. Dolly was putting up an argument. That stopped him. He glowered about the cabin once more, helplessly, then he grunted and turned toward the door. Very well, Donovan, but if I ever find out you've been engaging in any skullduggery, come, Captain Hansen. And they left, Hansen tossing me a swift, saved-by-the-bell glance, 
that meant undying affection and a bonus in next month's salary. So I muttered, I hope you don't, and when their footsteps faded from earshot, I made a dive for the concealed set. But I'd missed the important part. John Marlow was just signing off when I got the phones on. Captain Biggs will then lift his command, came the closing sentence, from Mars Central in accordance with the orders which await him there. That is all, Saturn. And he was gone. Boy, I was nearly busting. I couldn't wait for the sonic to die away so I could tap Biggs in the turret. What did he say, Lance? I hollered. Cooper came pussyfooting and then I missed the message. So you're going to get a command, eh? Congratulations? Tell me. My nerves were like red-hot worms as I listened for Biggs's answer. And then, wonk, went my set suddenly. Gwobble whee! Out of order. Again. Well, that was a stinker. But I had learned some things anyway. That Biggs was in line for a captaincy, and that his new command was waiting for him at Mars Central. I dug a copy of Lloyd's Spaceways out of my desk file and leafed through it. The information was encouraging. Vessels landed at the Martian port included the transport, Antigone, the lugger, Tethys 6, and the brand new, magnificent, special extra deluxe passenger liner, Orestes. Any one of these ships would be a feather in the cap of the skipper who took a bridge. Lancelot Biggs was getting off to a big start. So I should have been very happy for him. But I wasn't. Not altogether. Somehow I couldn't help feeling it wouldn't be the same ship, the Saturn, I mean, with Biggs no longer ambling the quarter-deck. A sentimental sap? Well, maybe I am. But when you have laughed and cried and fought and triumphed and shared sadness and joy with a right, tight, snug little gang of men, all of whom you love like brothers, you hate to think of one of them leaving you. And that's the way it was aboard the Saturn. Sure, we had our little squabbles and fusses. Wilson is a sort of show-off, and Todd sometimes has a tendency to let others do his work. The old man's not much of an astrogator any more. After all, he's been pushing either for more years than I've been alive. He's not as smart and alert as some of the fresh young brevetmen, and Biggs's genius for getting us in tough spots is second only to his ability at getting us out again. But we're a team, see? And now, with Biggs moving up the ladder, some strange new guy would come in. It was hot. I'd been so busy with a crying towel that for a few minutes I didn't realise just how hot it was. But now, glancing at the thermometer on my wall, I was jolted to see the mercury standing at 98 degrees. Without pausing to recollect that the audio system was out of order, I reached for the wall phone, bawled into it. Ahoy the bridge! Something's gone wrong with her! That's what I meant to yell, anyway, as a matter of strict truth. I got just as far as, Ahoy, blub! For the moment I yanked the earpiece off the audio, a pencil of clear cold water shot from the instrument like a diminutive geezer. Smack in the tonsils it slapped me, and I turned and hightailed it for the door. My guard, a gob named Jorgens, let loose a roar as I appeared. Oh no, Sparks, I got orders to keep you in your cabin, he bellowed. That's what you think, I yelled back. I'm not going to be roast Donovan for you or anybody. I'm hot. Then maybe this will cool you down. He grabbed the fire hose, pointed it at me, turned the wheel. I wailed and waited for the punching gout of water to sweep me off my feet. But it didn't come. There came a rushing sound, and from the nozzle spilled air. Jorgens dropped the hose with a howl of surprise. He gave up all idea of stopping me. As a matter of fact, he was three steps ahead of me by the time we hit the end of the corridor, but I beat him up the Jacob's ladder leading to the bridge by the simple expedient of using his vertebrae as rungs. Together we charged through the upper passageways, turned onto the ramp that feeds the bridge. By now, everything had gone stark staring mad. All the time we were on the hoof, I kept hearing music and every once in a while a wild burst of static rasped my eardrums, and the heat increased. 
It took me some minutes to realize, with a burst of horror, that the music was coming from the radiators, the static from the darkened electric bulbs set in the ceilings, and the heat was pouring in a torrential flood from our air supply, the ventilating system. We reached the bridge, shouldered the door open. But the situation wasn't any better there. If anything, it was worse. Cap Hansen, perspiration streaming down his red face, straining his jacket, was bending over a calculating machine that was flickering hazily with moving pictures. Across the room, Lieutenant Todd was masterfully struggling to subdue the clamour of a generator that was chattering wildly in the universal code, dots and dashes. Above the bedlam, I managed to make myself heard. "'What's wrong?' I bawled. The old man acknowledged my presence with one look of torment. "'The ship's gone nuts. The heater plays music and the telephones are spring. There's static in the lights and electricity in the gas jets. The ventilators give heat, and Slops just called me on his refrigerator to tell me the gas stove is spitting ice cubes.' Cooper, his face flaming with rage, pulled his paws from his ears long enough to scream. "'This is a disgrace to the service. Whoever caused this should be cashiered, and by the Lord Harry.' Just then the door opened, and into the room, with a big friendly grin on his pan, gangled our lanky lieutenant, Lancelot Biggs. "'Hello, folks,' he said amiably. "'Sort of, sort of noisy around here, isn't it?' Cooper glared at him wildly. "'Biggs, get out of here. You're supposed to be up in the turret repairing that radio set. Get along.' Biggs smiled, sort of sheepishly. His unbelievable Adam's apple de looped the loop in his throat. He coughed gently. "'Well, er, uh, you see,' he said, "'that's what made me come down here. I—I I guess I must have got a little bit mixed up in the wiring. I got the circuits all crossed up, and, well, darn it, this is what happened.' By sheer coincidence, just at that moment the air stopped hissing, the music stopped playing, and the tumult that had been flooding the room died away to a whisper. In a brief, horrible silence, I heard Captain Hansen gasp, Lance! Lance! and heard the incredulous snort of Inspector Cooper. What? You caused this, Lieutenant? Biggs's pale eyes shifted and he twisted his lanky frame into a pretzel. Re reckon I did, sir. Couldn't seem to get things straightened out in the turret, so I, I went down to the control room, and, and I guess I must have turned the wrong knobs or switches or something. His excuse dwindled into silence. But Cooper did not. Cooper loosed a blat like a robot wired for newscasting. Wrong knobs, wrong switches, indeed, sir. He swung to me, sweating painfully and quivering like an electroscope in a pitch-blend mine. Sparks, can you do anything about this, this disgraceful mess? I couldn't meet Biggs's eyes, nor could I meet those of Cap Hansen. I just nodded slowly. I think so, sir. Then get to work. And as for you, Lieutenant, his eyes burned Biggs's pale, embarrassed face. It will not now be necessary to determine whether or not you are versed in safety code practices. You have demonstrated very well that you are not yet capable of assuming the rank and duties of a commanding officer. Your butter-fingered handling of a simple routine test has resulted in the most disgusting contretemps it has ever been my lot to witness, Cap Hansen said. But— but look, Inspector, he's only a boy. Anybody can make a little mistake. Give him a chance to. There is no place for boys, snorted Cooper, on the bridge of space-going vessels. Lieutenant Biggs has possibilities, yes. But I shall suggest to the SSCB that he be given another year of intensive training under an old accomplished spaceman, yourself, Captain Hansen, that he may learn resourcefulness coolness, how to act under stress of emergency. And now, gentlemen, I shall retire until we reach Mars Central. Sparks, for God's sake, quiet this bedlam as soon as possible. And he stalked from the bridge with as much dignity as a man can muster, 
with hands clapped over a pair of sweat-dripping ears. I went below. It was a mess, but not an impossible one. I got it straightened out in fifteen or twenty minutes, and by the time things were back to normal, we were warping into the cradle lists at Mars Central Spaceports. Afterward, everybody was sympathetic, but Wilson said, Too bad, Biggs, but you'll get another chance. And he went out. Dick Todd said, Oh, how the hell with it, Lance? You were just a little excited, that's all. And he left too. And that left Biggs and the skipper and me alone in the turret. Biggs squirmed and said meekly, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to be such an idiot, but, well, after all, I am young, and I haven't had your experience. The skipper still looked like a man who'd grabbed a live wire by accident. He shook his head sadly. I wouldn't have thunk it of you, Lancelot's son, he grieved. You were always so quick at grasping things before this. I was banking on you to make it two captains in the same family. But, well, let bygones be bygones. Next year you'll have another test, and in the meantime I'll try to teach you more about how to act in emergencies. Biggs said gratefully, Thank you, sir. And, and Diane? We won't tell her, said the old man promptly. I always say that what women don't know won't hurt them. We'll keep this to ourselves. But, mind you, a flash of the old fire lighted his weathered, space-faded eyes. But mind, I want you to study hard during this next year. If you want to win your stripes, you've got to listen to a wiser head. Yes, sir, said Lancelot Biggs. I will, sir. Then the skipper left. A great old guy, no longer listless and lackadaisical, space-weary, but a new man, imbued with a strong fighting new urge, to help a young man earn his spurs. There was something admirable in his attitude, and something a little pathetic, too. And after he had left, I turned to Biggs. I said, OK, pal, come clean. He started. I, I beg your pardon, Sparks. Come, I repeated, clean. You can fool some of the people some of the time, and you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool some of the people some of the time. And I'm them, Biggs. I know you like I know my own hangnails. I've seen you in a thousand tight spots, and I never once knew you to go into a dither. But you messed this one up so bad that it smelled from here to Pluto. Now I want to know why. Biggs's eyes looked like saucers. His larynx jumped up and down painfully. I don't know what you mean, Bert. Talk, I said grimly, or I start rumours. Why? And then Lancelot Biggs grinned. So I made it look bad, eh, Bert? Bad? Awful! That heat! Great Comet's pal, you nearly killed us all! But why? I heard part of that transmission from Luna. I heard enough to know that if you passed your final test, you were going to be given a command immediately, a ship of your own, the Tethys or the Antigone or the Orestes, all good ships. Biggs said quietly, There was another one, Bert. What? No, there wasn't. I looked it up. There were only those three waiting captainless in port. But there would have been four, he said. If I'd passed my exam, Sparks, Cap Hansen's a great guy, isn't he? Sure, a grand old timer, but... And then, suddenly, I got it. Got it, and realised what an all-around humdinging hell of a real man Lancelot Biggs really is. I said, you mean, you mean that if you had earned your stripes, the old man was going to be set down and you'd be placed in command of the Saturn. Is that it? Why, you... And I swallowed hard, and I gave him a shove, and I said, Oh, Lance! But Lancelot Biggs isn't the kind of guy you can act gooey with. He just grinned again, and he said, Sparks, old timer, what do you say you and me have a drink or three, eh? So we did. 
double without soda. The end. Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. You know, many of these stories were written in a time where 50 years ago was in the future.